Um, this all comes together in the topic of his talk. Without further ado, um, I welcome our speaker. Uh, over to you, Ahen. Hi. Good evening or good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Here in the Netherlands, it's evening. Uh, let me share my screen. And hopefully that will work. Uh, here we go. Um, so indeed, my talk is on a tool called HydroFloods. We'll get in the acronym later, which is an open source tool for uh, flood monitoring. Um, but before we go there, um, well, this is what I'd like to discuss uh, today. Uh, brief introduction, uh, move into a little bit of background and uh, show you the applications we currently have and then end with uh, the developments that we're currently working on. Uh, but first of all, what is Deltaris? Um, we are an independent institute for applied research. And we mainly deal on the topic of uh, water, subsurface, and infrastructure. And we uh, have a firm conviction for open source. So uh, very happy to be here at Phosphor G. Uh, you can see here our mission goals, which were recently redefined. Um, they all state deltas in them, just as in our name. Uh, but we see delta in a very broad uh, spectrum in the sense that anything that is uh, even remotely connected to a delta, that's something that we uh, also are interested in. So we also deal with upstream catchments. Uh, they always end up in the delta anyway. Uh, and what is Severe? Um, well, Isaacson already briefly touched upon it. It is a joint initiative by uh, USAID and NASA. Uh, with various hubs uh, across the globe, as you can see on this uh, picture. And uh, in the Mekong hub, which is in Southeast Asia, uh, this one is led by the Asian Disaster Preparedness Center, ADPC, and then a consortium of parties with the Stockholm Environment Institute, uh, Spatial Informatic Groups, and Deltaris. That's us. <clears throat> And I think Sophia has a nice slogan, which is uh, connecting space to village. And it, it really lives up to this as well. It, it's a uh, very much, uh, even though it's a very large program with uh, USAID and NASA all across the globe, they really use a stakeholder centric approach, uh, bottom up, uh, really driven by local needs, uh, and then try to bring in the best space technologies to, to help them. So indeed, connecting space to village. Um, I was sadly a little bit late, so I don't know uh, how much background information the Earth, observ Earth observation has already been going on. Um, and I don't know what the audience is either. Um, that's one of the downsides of these virtual conferences. Um, but very briefly, one slide on each uh, type of sensor we're using. We have the optical sensors, um, which um, for uh, those who never work with Earth observation, it's basically like a camera from space, uh, except that it can see a lot more than your regular camera, also include infrared and others. And then something relatively a bit more new. Uh, this was also uh, touched upon in uh, Guy's uh, topic a lot, uh, I suppose, uh, was synthetic aperture radar, or SAR. Uh, which is quite different from optical. Uh, it has some advantages and some disadvantages. Um, but the biggest advantage is that it can penetrate clouds and darkness while optical sensors cannot, um, which is especially for uh, flood applications very relevant because, of course, floods happen often when there's a lot of rainfall and rainfall happens when there's a lot of clouds. So uh, very often you're going to have your uh, flood areas obscured by clouds, and then these type of sensors are really the saving grace. Um, so onto the background. Uh, Severe has already been going on for quite a while. Um, I think we're now in our seventh year for Severe Mekong, if I recall correctly. <clears throat> and we've done a lot of things already. And uh, a couple of years ago, we developed this uh, surface water mapping tool, we called it. Um, this was back then solely based on Landsat, um, which is, of course, still a very great tool, but it had its limitations. Um, and we thought we had a pretty cool tool on our hand. Um, but most of the stakeholders we engaged with, they said, well, yeah, it looks nice and we can do some things with it. But what we actually really need is, uh, well, first of all, real-time data, as near real-time as possible. 
uh, and then we need it really for flood applications and preferably with a daily time step. Um, now that's of course the tricky part, um, but let's say as short as possible as time step as we can get it to. Um, and <clears throat> Sophia has this nice uh, service planning toolkit. This is this circle that you see here. Uh, so we really delved into this and did more stakeholder engagement, needs assessments, etc. And from that basically sprung up HydroFloods, which stands for the Hydrologic Remote Sensing Analysis for Floods. And our idea what this was to really combine as much sensors as we possibly can to really go towards that daily time step um, and then also make use of the data in an as much near real time fashion as possible. Um, but of course, there's already a lot of other flood mapping services out there. Um, I think some of the other presentations might have hinted at them as well. Here's a list of, well, some of them. It's probably not uh, exhaustive. That's why the uh, three dots are there at the bottom. There could be plenty more, uh, but these are definitely some of the major players. Um, you can also uh, see some of who might have given a presentation already here. Um, but why not one of these? Well, multiple reasons, but basically there was never the ideal combination that we really needed. Um, none of them really offered the exact combination of, first of all, continuous monitoring. So some of these tick maybe all the boxes, but they're activation based. So uh, it requires a government, a national government or another institute to uh, activate through some kind of protocol, the service, and then it will be started up. Uh, this is, for example, the case with the International Disaster Charter or Central Asia. And um, they are great charters. They have a lot of uh, power and they can also access data that's otherwise uh, unavailable or commercial. Uh, but because of this activation, it, it's, yeah, it was not really what uh, our users were looking for. And it's also mainly used for the, the super big disasters, the really big ones while Southeast Asia is hit by floods multiple times per year. Um, then none of them have this combination with multiple sensors, which is really needed uh, to go get this time step uh, down as much as possible. Um, and also to overcome some of the issues uh, of one sensor by uh, supplementing it with the other. And um, while this could all be achieved by some of the parties here uh, that are commercial entities, um, they are commercial entities and the users we engage with in South Asia, they, they really look for, um, well, preferably a free, but yeah, a, a relatively cheap uh, option because, um, yeah, they simply don't have very deep pockets and uh, they want to have a service. Um, well, they, they can pay you one off fee to create it, but they don't want to pay for a license or continuous uh, pay for it each time uh, this service is provided to them. And well, on top of that, uh, what, what makes Severe unique is that we, we really focus on this stakeholder engagement, uh, capacity building, co-development of tools with our users, uh, and we uh, embrace open science and open source uh, software. So delving a little bit into the science, I don't wanna go too deep into it, um, but yeah, how do we do these things? Um, well, hydro floods is uh, what we say, it's, it's sort of sensor agnostic. So it can use all kinds of different sensors with various algorithms. So we uh, imported algorithms from uh, literature, but we also developed our own. Um, so as a user, you can choose which algorithms you'd like to use for which sensor um, to get your uh, surface water maps or flood maps out. Um, what we currently use for our own operational services is um, an optical QA unit um, on the Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8 data sets. And on the Sentinel-1 SAR data set, we use an adapted version of the uh, Edge Atsu algorithm, originally developed by my colleague Gennady Donkitz. And we're currently working on the daily time step. So we work on a daily data fused product, which is the flowchart you see on the bottom left. This is already an outdated flowchart. It's already been updated. Um, but yeah, we hope to work on this and, and get it out there uh, in an open access uh, journal paper soon enough. Uh, so what is it that we 
really do what, what are our operations uh, well as we said we do open science and open source um, all our own developments are published in open access journals and any yeah developments that we deem useful and stable enough uh, are put into the github repository with uh, open source licensing uh, that you can see here on the bottom right and um, we're currently working on a web portal uh, with analytics we have a sort of beta version already up in the air uh, but yeah completely redesigned a new version should be coming soon uh, furthermore we also offer uh, dedicated data streams um, more on that when i go towards the applications and finally we offer capacity building uh, so for any user that would like to use the service or learn more about some of its aspects uh, general remote sensing, general Google Earth Engine, or uh, really specific, uh, this tool itself, uh, we can provide uh, capacity building. So onto the applications. Um, like I said, we offer dedicated data streams when possible. And the best example of that is the collaboration we have with the United Nations World Food Program, WFP, uh, which started in Cambodia. Uh, where they have their own uh, platform for um, impact and situation monitoring called PRISM. There was a talk just half an hour ago in another session, um, which, well, you probably missed if you were here, but I hope it is recorded uh, so you can look it back, which should be very interesting as well. Um, but with WFP, um, we uh, collaborate now already since the start of 2020, I believe, uh, where we provide them with these uh, flood maps of various sensors. Um, and we do this by hosting them on a cloud storage bucket, which they can directly ingest into their Prism platform. Um, so they have yeah, a continuous updated stream of service water maps and flood maps um and which they in their own platform and overlay with products they already using uh, like exposure and vulnerability uh, households population uh, those type of things and i would like to stress that for this to be a success um you really need this this co-development and uh pre-event coordination um you can't simply just yeah throw a service over the fence and, and hope that others will use it uh, in the way it's intended um, that's that's usually not the most effective approach um, so this was also a core part of uh, this collaboration and well uh, sadly um, it was already put to the test quite quickly uh, Cambodia was hit by uh, pretty severe floods in uh, October 2020 2020 seemed to be a pretty bad year for floods overall uh, and Cambodia was no exception. Um, luckily, then, uh, we did have uh, the data streams already available and uh, accessible by WFP and PRISM. And they could also share this with the uh, regional and national authorities. Um, and so it was already yeah, put to use in the field uh, and it helped uh, relevant uh, actors understand how the flood was evolving over time. You can see in the, the movie here, which are just a few snapshots uh, throughout the month of October, that this flood was really evolving over time and hitting different areas in different periods um, due to the, yeah, the rainstorm um, um, <clears throat> characteristics that were covering the area uh, caused by multiple typhoons. Um, but uh, yeah, at least it was put to good use. And it's also being used for more long-term planning um, because it, yeah, it really allows you to see, yeah, where's the flood water coming from and where is it going? So what can we do to prevent this in the future? Um, we also did a internal uh, research and development study um, by coupling this with a tool called RACE, which is really geared towards uh, infrastructure um especially infrastructure networks so you can think of roads but also pipelines uh, electricity or other types of things uh, in this study we focused on roads and uh, we chose a study area near mandalay in myanmar which was hit by a bad flood in 2019 i believe and this tool allowed us to uh, check uh, which roads were flooded which areas were inaccessible 
And here we specifically focused on hospitals. So we could see which hospitals were harder to reach for certain communities or if certain communities were even cut off completely from hospitals, um, which is of course not a good thing during a flood. Uh, the idea being this, yeah, you could use this uh, in a real-time fashion as well, uh, because yeah, that's what we do uh, operationally as well. Um, so that you could really use this to steer logistics of your uh, disaster relief during uh, an ongoing flood event. Um, moving on to the uh, development. So we're currently involved in a lot of, well, let's say external activities. Um, one of the exciting things is uh, there's a big project by ESA, the World Water Service Water Dynamics, uh, who hosted a round robin exercise, uh, well, already a, a few months ago, uh, where a lot of different institutions uh, tried to see, uh, yeah, what what's what's really the best way to map service water, um, and then yeah, what are the lessons learned from this? And that's something we're still working on. Um, we are working on uh, ISI data. So ISI is a, um, well, new space. It's sometimes dubbed uh, a commercial satellite provider of uh, SAR CubeSats. So um, Sentinel-1 is one of the most amazing satellites out there, but uh, especially in Asia, you only get one image uh, every couple of days. And ISI can offer one image every 24 hours, but it's a paid uh, data product. It's a commercial entity. And uh, through this ASA third-party mission, you can get access to the data and yeah, at least explore its potential. Uh, we're also part of the uh, Anticipation Hub, which is a group of humanitarian actors set up by the Red Cross uh, to really focus on anticipatory action. And we take place in the working group on uh, the use of Earth observation specifically for anticipatory action. And well, plenty of other initiatives that's, that are going on, but I won't go into all of them right now. Um, so what are we working on really specifically um, development-wise? Um, well, this is a, a list. First of all, we have on our to-do list already for a long time to include even more sensors, um, one of them being uh, passive microwave sensors. Uh, which would really help with the time step. But uh, as you might know, these have a very low spatial resolution. So high temporal, but low spatial. That's the usual trade-off. Um, but yeah, this, this would be great uh, to add. Um, we're looking at improved sensor fusion. Um, I recently uh, supervised a student who, who looked at uh, specific differences between optical and SAR. And we're also doing our own internal research uh, on this sensor fusion. Uh, deep learning uh, is also, or machine learning, whatever you want to call it, uh, something that we're looking into. Uh, this was a really strong effort by many of my colleagues in Surfeer. And um, this presentation I made two days ago, and then it's still set in review, but I can happily announce that it was just accepted the paper, so I can scratch through the in review, and it should be coming out soon. Um, we're also looking at flood depths. Um, this is something also that's, that's yeah, uh, our users really express that this is something they would like. And we always at the beginning said, well, yeah, that's just sort of impossible. Uh, but now that we have most of the other things worked out, we can start to look into this. And there's yeah interesting work by a lot of other research groups uh, going on. Um, and the ones we found most promising was the work by Cohen and Peter, who have a tool called the flood water depth estimation tool. And this is something we are playing around with and seeing if we can add on our own developments to really go more towards uh, flood depths as well. Um, and that also links to the next topic, which is yeah, impacts and analytics. Um, because for most of the flood impacts, it really helps if you know this flood depths, uh, especially if you want to go towards damage. And this is where another uh, master thesis comes in that I recently uh, supervised, which really specifically looked at agricultural damage uh, in a case study in Cambodia. But of course, there's a lot of other things that you can think of, uh, especially like affected population, which is, of course, a very important one, uh, but also a very tricky one because, uh, yeah, you could simply overlay a population map with your flood map, which is what has been 
done um, by a lot of other groups as well. And while that gives sort of a first estimate indication, it, it's not really affected population because, um, well, first of all, uh, people can be somewhere else. Um, they, they might not be where they are now. They might be at work. They might be on vacation. They might have known that this flood was coming and they would be evacuated. On the other hand, they are still affected in a sense if their house is flooded and they are not flooded. Um, but that also goes further. For example, if a, a farmer has all his fields uh, flooded, um, yeah, I would say he is affected, even though his house and himself might not be flooded. And there's a lot of other factors at play there that really inv yeah, influence this, this affected population that makes it really hard to uh, narrow it down. But yeah, we, we look forward to working on that. Um, the web portal, something I already mentioned, uh, should be coming soon as well. And we're also trying to engage with other actors and other stakeholders, um, always. So that's it. Um, if you have any questions, I'd love to hear them. We have uh, 10 minutes left, right on time. And if you want to contact me here, you have uh, the relevant details. Thanks. OK, uh, thank you again for, for the presentation. And uh, I really uh, like the, the, the demonstration of the Cambodia uh, uh, case whereby it was showing how the flood was evolving uh, with time during that month of October. And um, to everyone who wants to contact uh, uh, our speaker, it, they are the contact details. And um, uh, to those joining us, please, uh, if you have a question, please leave in the in the question section. Um, because right now, currently, we don't have a question in the in, this, in that section. But I think um, those who are joining us might actually even uh, send us send you uh, or forward you some questions uh, relating to your presentation. So that's all. That's of course fine. Uh, if anybody has a question right now, it's more convenient if you yeah. Ask it now because then otherwise others might benefit. But uh, feel free to contact me over email or uh, other mediums. That's also fine. Yeah, yeah, that that is true. Yeah. So I will just leave them up up a bit. Uh, the details, uh, the screen of the details, so that uh, we give anyone who is joining us uh, to maybe even uh, follow you on LinkedIn and also. Uh, look at uh, the Hydra floods uh, too, and also some information on that. Yeah. Yeah, good point. Uh, if you do want to connect with me on LinkedIn, please write a message. Uh, yeah, something. I don't uh, accept just random uh, invitations. I, Isaacson and, and Arjun, I, I do see in the yeah. the main chat um, a, a question there. Uh, that that says what is the main difference between optical and SAR sensors in flood detection? For uh, flood detection, um, the main difference. Well, there's a lot of differences between them, um, but I would say the main difference for flood detection is really the fact that um, the the radar, the SAR, can penetrate clouds. Um, really, especially in our Southeast Asia region, uh, which is a notoriously cloudy region in general. Um, but especially during flood, um, yeah, flood season, you could almost say, because it, it nearly always happens during the monsoon season. You can imagine that it's, it's very cloudy there. Um, and then this SAR signal really, really helps uh, to do this uh, land cover wide mapping. Landscale wide mapping, I should say. But there's many other differences. Uh, and in, if you actually do have a cloud free image, um, we have found, but that really depends on the, the landscape characteristics. Um, optical can be, um, yeah, how to put it? Um, I'm like, I don't want to say of, of better quality, but yeah, more helpful in a way uh then sar uh, it's, it seems to be able to yeah a little bit more accurately 
uh, map out the water. We had some case studies um, with various floods where we, we, we heard from the field, yeah, this was not flooded and that was flooded. And our, our yeah, if we looked at the, the SAR signal, we really couldn't find that, even if we looked at more raw signal. Uh, and in the optical, it was there. But this is really, yeah, looking at relatively small areas for, for really uh, the bigger picture, uh, SAR is, is excellent. Um, the, 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 uh, yeah, there's a. Okay, you may go ahead, Jeff. Please. Yeah, yeah sorry, I was in. Um, if, yeah, I'm. I'm. Just, I'm monitoring the chat, and I'm just sorry if you are as well. Just let me know. But uh, there was a follow-up question from the same attendee um, with a, uh, a question: What is the most effective optical technique for flood detection? Which is a. Uh, it's a, you might, I'll give it to you, Arjun, but it's, yeah, it's a, it, I think, I suspect your answer is going to start with, it depends. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, my answer would have started with that, but let me try not to now. Um, <clears throat> it's a good question, though. Um, the best technique for optical flood mapping. Um, yeah, there, there's, there's so many different techniques out there and you can group them perhaps to make it a little bit more easier um, in the sense that you can do uh, sort of generic surface water detection um, and change detection, um, which yeah can also both be applied to SAR uh, imagery. Um, and yeah, those have their, their pros and cons. Um, the change detection one can give you direct flood water um because you're really only looking at the, the changes that are occurring so you don't get the water in your main river channel which is yeah not really what you're concerned in anyway um the surface water mapping you do get this water in the main river channel so if you want to distinguish between flood waters then you yeah you have to get some reference water map uh, which you could also do with um satellites um it, it yeah, requires this two-step approach, but it does give you more freedom in defining this reference water. Um, so you can yeah, more easily tweak that. Um, yeah, what is best? Uh, <laughs> indeed, it depends. Uh, I don't think there's a silver bullet. OK, uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Um um do we have any more questions um let me just check from the chat okay yeah it seems uh it seems all the questions are answered and uh thank you for answering the questions uh that we directed you and um maybe if we eat in your time maybe you allow us <laughs> any final parting words i am <laughs> Uh, no, thanks for the questions and uh, thanks for moderating both uh, to you and David. Looking forward to the next talks. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, goodbye for now, everyone. Uh, who was in this session? Yeah. Um, okay. Um, uh, then we now move uh, to the next session. Now on uh, defining temporal spatial data quality aspects for OpenStreetMap, uh, which will touch on uh, the work uh, being done uh, uh, 